we're starting uh, off the quarter with a kind of a two-prong uh, uh, look at uh, legislation in Alabama. And um, the first, our, our first seminar is going to be given by uh, Mr. John Hay, who is uh, the uh, research uh, associate with the Alabama Family Alliance. And uh, he is uh, uh, working with the governor and the governor's office on uh, these, the issue of school funding, and that's what he's going to be talking about today, judicial welfare, the case of school funding in the state of Alabama. So welcome, John, and uh, take it away. Thanks for having me. I have to say right at the start, I'm more of a formal speaker, so uh, we'll see how I do in this kind of setting. Uh, but... Basically, we're going to be talking about judicial welfare, and by that, we don't mean welfare in perhaps the common sense that we all think of welfare, food stamps, AFDC, things like that, but we will be talking about a special kind of welfare that still involves transfers of monies from a specified party to another party. Uh, I guess uh, Cleveland will talk, Professor Cleveland will talk about Bastiat some, but... Uh, I like a quote that Bastiat had. It's called a, he calls uh, welfare or socialism the politics of plunder, and basically that's uh, what we're going to be talking about here in the judicial welfare cases. Sometimes this plunder is accomplished through a so-called representative vote. Uh, usually, there, this is accomplished after long appeals to decency, compassion, and all the other uh, heartstring issues. Sometimes the redistribution is accomplished through the bureaucratic tinkering. It's amazing what uh, unelected bureaucrats can accomplish without anyone knowing about it. And still other times, uh, this redistribution is a result of decrees from a judge's bench. In the case of school funding, we get a little bit of everything. We, of course, have the emotional appeals for the sake of the children. Uh, this, uh, this emotional onslaught led to the compulsory education that we uh, have today, in which all children are required to attend school. Uh, at this point, I should uh, point out that the Constitution is silent on education, and the Alabama Constitution doesn't provide any uh, inherent right to education either. But uh, uh, you want to know that according to the plaintiff's brief in the uh, latest lawsuit. Now, some people don't quite realize that the argument for financing uh, school education is that the whole society benefits from this education, just, which is also, of course, the reason we made it compulsory, and therefore the whole area should pay for the education. In other words, for a public, fu publicly financed education, the parents of the children are, are, on average, getting a pretty good deal. And we could call this a type of welfare in which uh, monies are transferred from the whole population to a specified group, the parents of the children, for the purposes of the children's education. However... It goes much further than that in the current lawsuit. Basically, this, the plaintiffs in the lawsuit charge, and I'm going to paraphrase, that due to the uh, rampant uh, racism, meanness, selfishness, and general unfairness of life, they've gotten a raw deal. Um, you see, some areas of our state have citizens that have a higher, higher average income and uh, net worth than other areas. Um, these same areas also have higher property values than, the, than other areas. And this is seen as unfair because even at equivalent rates, whether you're talking about sales tax or property taxes, uh, the so-called richer areas will raise more revenue for their schools than the poorer areas. Um, to add insult to injury, these richer areas often tax themselves at higher rates than the poorer areas, which creates a large gap in school funding. The uh, plaintiffs basically came and uh, got together and argued uh, that it's not enough for education to be adequate, it needs to be equitable or equal, which of course is a word that gets bandied about a lot nowadays. What they, they haven't had any uh, relief through the representative body or the legislature. No one's really bought the argument. Um, basically, I guess Alabamians... Most Alabamians, although, are willing to put up with um, helping fund their neighbors' kids, but they're not willing to help fund uh, kids halfway across the, the education half of kids halfway across the state. Um, so, of course, the only relief 
if you want to have your will as far as uh, getting more money for educational funding is to go through the courts. Um, the best way to do this would be f to find a sympathetic judge who harbored ambitions for higher office, and that is what they did. Uh, circuit, uh, the court case, Alabama Coalition for Equity, which is now versus Jim Folsom Jr., it was, of course, filed under Guy Hunt's administration and was later also consolidated with a Mary Hopper uh, and some others in Alabama Disability Advocacy Program. Um, they, they filed this before Judge Dean Reese, who is a county circuit court judge, and uh, which we'll get, get to that later as to whether or not his, where his authority stands on the issue. Um, basically, the <clears throat> governor's position has been that the judge did not have the authority to tell the legislature and the governor what to do. And that's, of course, a separation of powers doctrine, which is found in the United States Constitution, but is also found specifically in the Alabama Constitution. Judge Gene Reese has, of course, asserted that he does have the authority, but when push comes to shove, he has extended his deadlines twice, when basically everyone's just ignored his orders to comply. Um, and to, to show you a couple of the the social engineering, the, the do-goodisms, do and just the general social leveling that is inherent in this remedy order that uh, Judge Jim Reese came up with, I'd like to read you a few of the gems uh, that in his findings and the opening statements are the finding that all Alabama students, all Alabama students can learn at significantly higher levels. The diversity, including racial and ethnic, that parents, teachers, and students bring to Alabama's education system must be respected, and all education must be provided in an atmosphere free, free from prejudice of whatever variety. Then he provides us with a capacity that he expects students to acquire sufficient support and guidance so that every student feels a sense of self-worth worth, and ability to achieve, and so that every student is encouraged to live up to his or her full human potential. Now, there's not a whole lot of education going on right now. Um, and then as far as implementation, he says that you shouldn't track students. A paragraph later, he says, students with cognitive disabilities should be taught economic, social, and self-help skills and environments, which are the same as those in which they shall perform those skills. So in other words, you can't track them, but you have to separate them too. So, however, the saddest aspect of the remedy, or at least from my perspective, is that beneath all the talk of educational performance and student achievement lies the implicit conclusion that the terms adequate and equitable are defined solely in dollars. His remedy order, remedy order doesn't even have a marginally specific definition of educational performance. It does, however, contain a long list of physical inputs the state is required to furnish, as well as the levies to be used to raise the necessary revenue. And just to, to pick out a couple select um, ones to show you about. Under programs, he uh, requires that appropriate student-teacher ratios and adequate guidance, health, and library services, along with adequate, adequate clerical and support staff. Well, anyone who's tracked school staff over the last 30 years knows that they don't need more support staff. They need more classroom personnel, or either the revenues need to get to the classroom to support personnel that are in the classroom, the actual, the actual classroom teachers. A state plan shall be developed and implemented that minimizes the degree to which health problems, malnutrition, abuse and neglect, and lack of basic necessities, i.e. housing and clothing, interfere with students' access to an adequate and equitable education. The state plan shall include funding to assist students in elementary and secondary schools and provide an operating budget and staffing based on the number of at-risk students in the school. That, of course, at-risk is actually defined as the number of students eligible for free or reduced price lunches, which probably gives you a window of insight into the furor over the school lunch controversy in our nation's capital, and that is all government programs that have anything to do with education are tied to at-risk students, and at-risk students are defined as school lunch kids. So for better or for worse, that's pretty much the string of how it goes. All schools which are eligible for a school breakfast program shall implement it. Parental education programs will be provided for parents of disadvantaged students in grades K through 3. So we're going to start uh, a parent's school for 
kindergarten for K through three. An early childhood education development program shall be developed and implemented to supplement Head Start. Preschool services for three to five year olds shall be provided for children with disabilities. So we're going to start up a three to five year old school for disabled children. These are extra schools and programs. And I think it's at this point that it becomes rather obvious that the remedy order has as much to do with salvaging and preserving what we have traditionally thought of as welfare programs as it does in furthering education. So even if you want to talk to someone about proving that education funding is a case of welfare, well, you pretty much have an easy job of it now. He's explicitly united them all in one little basket, or one big and growing basket, probably better. He, under buildings, uh, G Judge Reese uh, declares that schools shall have adequate science laboratories, computer and foreign language facilities, administrative offices, sick rooms, auditoriums, gymnasiums, cafeterias, athletic facilities, and vocational facilities. They shall have libraries and media spaces appropriate in equipment, lighting, and materials. Uh, the spaces shall be of suitable size and format, and on and on and on. It's just minute detail, the same, and is comparable to what a lot of judges have done to the prison system. Uh, in, in that they have specifically said that each prisoner is entitled to three frisbees or each prisoner is entitled to so many so many items of this or that. Um, my favorite uh, order is that school buildings and grounds shall be clean, safe, and sanitary. Bathroom supplies, including soap, paper towels, and toilet paper, shall be available in adequate supply. So Judge Reese is going to make sure that they have paper towels and toilet paper. Then all buses built before 1977 shall be replaced immediately. All students who meet reasonable distance requirements will be provided with free transportation. So basically, this is a catch-all to make sure that every kid that could possibly get free transportation will get it, even if parents have been making sacrifices or people have been carpooling or whatever. Now the impetus will be to just go ahead and be bused. And then there is a long, page-long list or so of all the materials that the state needs to make sure that they supply and that each student will have his own personal copy of each type of material. Uh, then in the next section, which may even be the longest specific section, Judge Reese deals with students with disabilities. After you read this section, it becomes clear that the entire educational program will be, will be built around disabled students, not that they will be main, even mainstream, not that they will be um, adequately prepared, but that the whole structure of the, of the school will be tied into the performance and the adjustment of disabled students in the school's population. I would read some of it, but it's about three pages long. It's one of the longest parts of the branding order. And then under the funding program, he sets forth how the funding will happen. And this is where it gets really interesting. The state shall establish a foundation program to adequately fund every child's, every child's education. The state has six years in which to totally phase in this program. And then he says school funding, both among schools, school systems, among schools within school systems, shall be equitable. The funding system shall minimize educational disadvantages due to economic or social deprivation. The foundation program shall require a uniform local tax effort equalized by the state so that every school child shall receive an adequately funded educational opportunity regardless of factors such as local indifference, low aspirations, or other conditions unrelated to educational need. So basically, the parents don't care, the community doesn't care, the kid doesn't care, but he, gosh darn it, he's going to do good in school, you know, and we're going to make sure. Authorization for local school system taxes shall be uniform. School systems shall distribute all resources among the schools within each system in an equitable manner. The system of fringe benefits for state and local school employees shall be equalized by incorporation into the foundation program. Equitable and equalized are a big a catchphrase in here. Basically what it means is that under the system as it now is, a community or le tax levying authority is assured of the percentage of local revenue that will come, be coming back to their school. And they, they usually set that percentage themselves when they pass the uh, bill or whatever the levy is. Well, now basically what, what we're saying is it'll go to the state, and there we might mix it up a little, you know, and spread it out a little, and uh, just make things kind of equal. And this is, of course, what some people have characterized, you know, Robin Peter to pay Paul, 
it's the politics of plunder. It just sounds good, and it sounds, um, according to the Constitution, you know, hey, everybody's equal. So that's basically what it's looking at. Unless you any have any have have any doubt that this is the case, he says that the funding system <laughs> shall direct relatively greater resources to children with measurably greater needs. A waiting system shall be established for this purpose. Um, as an aside, I should probably say that the poor school systems also have an incredibly high proportion of children that have been diagnosed with disabilities. As a matter of fact, Alabama is almost a... I shouldn't say it's, uh, it's, it's very high. In some counties, it's 30% or so. Uh, it basically came about through the SSI disabilities program and the lump retroactive payments that were available for parents and school children who acted up. And so if they act up, and as, as a article in the Birmingham News said, they act dumb, we can buy them pretty things, and at least they look good. So that's what we have going on in a lot of the, the poor school systems. So, of course, the state's caught in a catch-22 in some areas because another part of the order says, of course, now that I've set up all the incentives for you to have more kids diagnosed as disabled, I just want to make sure that you don't do that. And that's another thing it says in that same paragraph. But so the state's really caught right there in that, as far as that goes. This, this um, part of the revenue order could even result in the poor poorer school systems leaping ahead of the so-called richer, richer school systems in that they will have been equalized and then you also will have uh, additional weighting for children with disabilities. Now I'm not I'm not going to fund I'm not going to talk about this from a moral immoral perspective. We can get to that at the end. I'm just saying that no matter what you hear the goal is flat, serious Attempts at equality and not equi not adequacy, but equality as we would think sameness. Um, and he also goes on to say that the transportation funding will be separate from the foundation program. In other words, we're going to meet all the uh, so-called educational goals of Judge Reese, and then we're also going to meet the transportation goals of Judge Reese, and they will be separate funding programs, and that is so that they all can grow. In other words, the state will, when they look at transportation costs, will not look at the money they have and try to say, we're going to take this much towards transportation, this much or this. The state has to see how much it will cost to fund the remedy order, say, in transportation, and then they have to meet it. And that's just the way it is as far as the remedy order is concerned. Then another foundation, I should say foundation program, another fund shall be provided outside the foundation program to eliminate all physical plant deficiencies within five years. This is of course, the schools with the, the ceilings falling down. And pri priority will be according to per capita. It will not be according to per capita, but according to need. So once again, um, use of facility obviously could be correlated with the amount of students that go through it. But in this case, it will be correlated with how well or not how well a local school system has taken care of their building. If they haven't taken very good care of it, they'll get more money. And and uh, the building will be updated. Okay, so basically, I, what I'd like to point out, as far as this this case for school funding that you've heard about in uh, Judge Reese's um, court, is a classic, is, uh, from my perspective, example of a way to redistribute redistrib the wealth. And of course, the battle cry is the children, the children. How can you not help the children? And under this guise. Not only educational equity will be achieved, but all kinds of what we used to think of as pure welfare type programs will be folded into the educational program and then will also be funded. So that's basically all I have. Ooh, I mean, quite a mess. It, it's a real mess. I mean, there's. I, uh, I could have gone on. I know it gets a little boring when you're reading straight from, straight from the remedy orders and things like that, but. Um, there's just there's really nothing good in it. I mean, you know, I hate to I hate to say it that way, but of course uh, the people of Alabama thought so also, and overwhelmingly rejected the judge's bid for the high court. So we're kind of stuck in in the uh, um, kind of he said 
He said, she said, if it's, he said, governor said, and who's going to call whose bluff? I mean, the, Judge Reese has seen no compulsion to uh, to charge anybody with anything for not for failing to uh, uh, come through on his remedy order. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see how it plays out. Well, before we get into the specifics, um, what does happen if, if, if the remedy order is simply ignored? Well, if the remedy order is ignored, we will have editorials in the paper that tell us how backward we are and what a redneck state this is and we need to catch up and you know we have a judge now and why are we uh, you know rejecting what the judge says and all that stuff but um i think that judge reese is just going to extend i think i think you're going to probably see at least one more extension and i i think what's basically only going to happen is the governor is going to come up with some kind of plan it's not going to touch hardly any of these points there's going to be some attempt at helping out the poor school systems, and they will kind of settle uh, out of the limelight, so to speak. That's what I think is going to happen. So the feds can't come in and... <laughs> well, is, if it gets uh, past Governor James' administration, maybe the feds will come in, but I think as, as long as Governor James is governor, it will be tried to be settled at the state level as much as possible. Who's the plaintiff coalition again? Um, it's the Alabama Coalition for Equity. Let me forgot that they changed the titles, changed a couple times because of consolidation. But it's the Alabama Coalition for Equity. Then another series of plaintiffs is, is individuals, parents, and their and their children. And Mary Harper et al. is how it's uh, put. And then um, and the Alabama Disabilities Advocacy Program. So there's three classes of plaintiffs that have been consolidated together. And then the, the defendant is, the only defendant left is the governor. All the other defendants switched over to plaintiffs and um, left, you know, the governor standing. And the school, state school board of education switched back and forth more than once. There was, <clears throat> I read in the Wall Street Journal a few years ago that a, uh, I believe it was a federal judge ordered an increase in local taxes to support the busing program. Is there any sort of precedent for what this judge is doing? I don't know what the resolution what that that federal court. Um, I'm not familiar with that exact one. I, I know as far as federal law, the, the case of Kansas City is, is the most um, comprehensive case in which the federal judge not only specifically set up the whole curriculum, set up the whole busing scheme, set up the whole physical plant scheme or what the buildings would be like, um, which Judge Reese goes close but not that far. He even passed the tax, just said, here, you have this tax, pay it. And it's going to go to education. In Kansas City, I think, just off the top of my head, they're spending approximately $8,000 per pupil, I think, now on education, which is... One of the highest I've ever heard of. Haven't I heard that the results have not shown any improvement in the education? No, they, they haven't. It's, it's it's been, I mean, it's been like all studies of, of funding and educational performance. Like the, there's no relationship. There's no relationship. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, if, if you look at Alabama, there may be a slight inverse relationship. Um, Alabama's per, per pupil spending has more than tripled, and that's in real dollars in the last 30 years, and test scores have decreased a couple tenths, as far as the ACT have decreased a couple tenths of a percentage point. Uh, I, I'm concerned about the um, quality of the teachers, the training and the ability of the teachers, and I didn't hear any of that refer to uh, the teaching staff. Well, basically what there is part in here for the teaching staff, and it's to give them extra staff days for professional development and to, to give them extra <laughs> professional development programs, which is, you know, which is how they would say they're getting more training. But a lot of this development will be, is, it's not said, but basically is to recognize the diversity of the school population and also meet special children. And, you know, it, it's the whole social training that the teachers will go I, through. I had an understanding that a lot of the teachers in Alabama are very 
underqualified. Now that's going too far, I'm sure, but that we do have that problem. We do have, have no comment. No, we do have a problem. With <clears throat> and I would think that's the first thing that if you want to approve this school, you would go to. Well, I I would agree. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I I would definitely agree. I, I my uh, if if I could just be, play God or be a judge, whichever, I would <laughs> just just write out. You know, I'd love to write out a, a order, and it'd be radically different from um, from this one. From this, one. Um, this one, I just is basically more. Of, it's 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 social. It's more than educational. By what authority does he make these requirements? It's. I meant to 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 relook this up, but uh, because I thought I had it clear, I was talking to someone. The the basic basic. Alabama Constitution is an interesting instrument, and basically the. There are equality, equal access type phrases, in the Alabama Constitution, just as in. Um, well, I guess the the equivalent would be due process, and they have taken that and from that say, well, that means of course a liberal education. Well, they said basically de facto education is a right that, that citizens recognize. They burden themselves to pay for it, and they made it mandatory. Um, then they say that. Um, this education then will, of course, just by definition, be liberal. A liberal education is broad-based, and not necessarily liberal as in political, but it soon becomes that way. And then it'll be broad-based, and then because it'll be broad-based, it'll be be ad- of course make, means it's adequate. Then it'll be equitable, and then you're 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 on down the slope, you know, heading for the bottom. I read some figures recently, and I'm not prepared to verify my exact figures, but they were approximately. That in America we're spending about a thousand dollars per child that's disabled, uh, about two and a half dollars per child who's gifted. In other words, we are spending a great deal of our. Ed- this is nationwide. Right. Uh, nationwide programs, perhaps, perhaps not the whole deal, but the uh, that seems to me to be highly inequitable and stupid. Well, you know, I, I would say that a, a society that targets targets subsidence to and this is going to sound hard. I'm just talking on a pure practical level. There's always, of course, room for, for personal charity and church charity, community organization charity. But when you target and set up societies or a portion of society in which you subsidize basically those who don't make it or those who who Have difficulties. don't difficulties, don't produce, whatever, you're really creating a, a situation that's not going to last. In other words, a civilization that's not going to Stay oh, coherent. It was like what you were saying with uh, the quality of the building. If they don't take care of their building and things start <coughs> falling apart, then those are the schools that are going to get money to have their buildings completely redone, refurbished. Right, and like and like earlier, the SSI thing, the dis- disability. I mean, we're talking thirty percent of some children, in, and I think it's higher than this. This was a Birmingham News investigative story <coughs> just a couple months ago, and we, of course. We're on the national news, some about that shame, shame, shame on Alabama. They're always, you know, making all the kids labeling all these kids, you know, disabled. Well, we had nothing, you know, the state, there's no malice intended. It is the parents, and they will not let you take their children off or let you retest the children to make sure it wasn't a fluke and that they are actually normal and not disabled. And of course, they're, they're being coached. A lot of them have been coached at so you, and when you say disabilities, you're not talking about physical disabilities. Here. You're talking about learning disabilities. When, when, when disabilities is talked about in the remedy order, it's not talking about someone who's lost a leg or a child with multiple sclerosis or anything like that. We're talking about disabilities as we have come to know them after the Disabilities Act, American Disabilities Act, and that is disability. Anything that you think is a disability. So. I mean, hyperactivity is has become attention deficit dis- disorder. I know some children do indeed have it, but it's being diagnosed at astounding rates these days. Astounding mm-hmm. rates. Yeah. How do they get the SSI? You get it? SSI benefits for kids who act up, <laughs> and you get lump sum. So you get a lump sum back payment, and so 
you can prove that your kid started acting up six years ago and that you just now gotten around to filing, well, <laughs> you know, you're, you're eligible for six full years worth of crazy money. Some people call it. Yeah, I've heard that. You know, crazy money. And so, and so the, what complicates is these are the exact same areas. They're coinciding with the areas in which the plaintiffs reside, asking for, mo- for more money in what we supposedly strictly educational expenditures. And so, yeah, I, I'm familiar with this in, in a different angle. This is when the parents coach the kids to go in and, get, and they get, quote, unquote, tested. Right. And if they qualify, they're given this money, and they're also put on Ritalin, right? The, the narcotic drug. Not, nece- not necessarily. It may not even be um, treated. Okay, well, see, the... the, the I came across this in a different connection where the where the uh, counselor or, or whatever uh, would put them on Ritalin to suppress this, but they would also get the money too. I mean, the, the reason the parents would coach them is to get the money, right? But the the attempt to remedy the situation is by putting them on, <clears throat> by putting the kids on narcotics, right? I mean, you know, it's just just drug them and take the money, and and of course. That doesn't leave much room for individual treatment. I mean, when you're warehousing kids through the school counselor's office, you're not, you can't really be claiming that you're doing it for a child's good. All of that is, of course, the claim. So. That's 30%? I, I, I am almost positive that it's, it's approximately 30% in some counties that school aged children have tested or are in the process of testing knowing that they will test positive for disabilities or they act up. Because that is now a disability. I mean, that is now a, a disorder. You know, defiant disorder, there's a disorder, oppositional defiant disorder. Um, you know, if, you ever, if you've ever... You should go through this. <laughs> go through DSM-4. It's, it's better than buying a... Joke book or something. Like that. <laughs> I shouldn't say that because I was in a graduate psychology, but I guess then I can say that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so are they trying to say then that, uh, as a matter of doing business, that uh, instead of expelling a child, they're going to pay that child and his parents for having deviant behavior? Now, now, see, that's not necessarily through the school. I mean, this is through SSI, but Judge Reese is now saying that. It's Disabilities, uh, school funding will be funneled or will be given, priority will be given to children who have greater need. And I'll read that as children with disabilities. I mean, they're right, they follow each other. And um, so, I mean, it's, it's the age old perverse incentive. You, 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 you get paid to be miserable. The more misery there is, the more money comes in. Or at least, at least you can put on misery, and that's that's of course what a lot of people think is the immoral immoral aspect of all welfare programs. In SSI is Social Security, is it Social Security? Social Supplemental Social Security is the it's uh, was established I guess in seventy. It's a Carter program, or near near that. Or if it's not Carter, it's, I can't say the word. Nixon? Nixon, yes. <laughs> yeah, he did. I mean, it's amazing what he his, the programs he put in place. Don't, don't they, doesn't that also go for alcoholics and drug addicts? Oh, yeah. They, they've just put forward bills, and this, of course, again, we're, we're back to the federal level. They've just put forward bills to try to cut that out. But basically, it goes to alcohol and drug addicts because... You're an alcoholic or drug addict. I mean, that's the reason you get it. Not in spite of, but because of. And um, re- uh, investigative reporter for Reader's Digest, which uh, I was reading the other day while I was sitting in the office waiting for the doctor. I got to read the whole thing. But, um... That's right. But uh, they would go... This, this investigative report would go down, basically skid row or, or, or see the bombs... And social welfare workers, federal bureaucrats, were handing out pamphlets 
to them saying, you may be eligible for SSI benefits. You may be eligible for retroactive lump sums. And this is, this is what private charity workers are calling death on the installment plan. You're paying people to kill themselves. Wasn't there a recent, uh, well, I know it wasn't in Texas, uh, something like this, a robin plan, something like this, an equalization plan where they're, they're taking money from the rich communities, the Dallas's and the uh, Houston's and whatnot, and trying to redistribute it throughout the state. Do you know what's come of that? Uh, that would set a precedent or anything? That may be gen generally in limbo, too. I, I think every time right it now it like is. Every time they got, got it situated where they, it, was a, it was another deal where the judge ordered it. Uh, ordered this, and then every time they got a, a plan in place, then it was challenged by you know, Dallas or some of the richer school districts, and it was always thrown out as being unconstitutional. Right. So it, I didn't know if that... Well, that, I mean, you know, like I was saying earlier, that's basically what we're looking at here. Right. Now, there is something called a hold harmless provision, and that says, after all this, there's this little one sentence in there that says, no school system will receive less funding and the first year of this plan, then received the year before. Basically, next year they're going to receive at least as much they receive. They won't lose money. So, the, so in other words, the, that sounds good, and that holds for the first year or two. But what it also means, though, is the money they now have may not be taken, but they will be levied, tax new forms of, of you know getting revenue, and they will and those will be directed against the school systems, the richer school systems. But those are really only the public school systems, the state school systems. Right, right. No, you can't no. levy against the private school systems. No, not, 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 not yet. Taxpayers. Except the taxpayers. Yeah. Well, I mean, of course, uh, people are sitting there. You know, if they talk about per pupil funding, but if all the private school kids were to go into the public school where they actually live, then we'd really see how efficient you know they could be. Is this causing any movement or backlash against... Um, this judge, do you see any significant trends away from from this, or is everyone just running headlong? He has a lot of people who do not like him, and, he, and like I said before, he blatantly used this issue as his platform for the high court. And when he gave his, I, I read the what he calls a preliminary remedy order, which does, which I asked some lawyers, and they said it does not exist. Um, because he's kind of changed remedy order, so this is the latest one that's called preliminary, and uh, and I was told remedy order is a remedy order, it's not. So basically, he knows he's kind of treading, but you know he he was just gunned down. I mean, no one bought any of that stuff that, about his courageous stand for education or any of that stuff. He lost, and it, I mean, he didn't lose horribly, but it was it was pretty substantial. Is that is that because of the the issue, or is that just because it's him? Well, I mean, in him, they they coincide to a great degree because he he is you know he's a, he's a social engineer and uh, he's also the same judge who, who uh, ordered you know this is the same judge who ordered the ballots to be counted in the Hooper contest. Now, you know, not to get into partisan politics, but I'm but I'm this is the exact same judge, Judge Reese, is the one who started the saying that ballots that have no Witnesses, signature, or notary are substantial and substantial compliance with a law. That's only two provisions: is you have witnesses or a notary. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's so. He this this qualified for the Supreme Court. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, qual he qualified. He just he just uh, lost. Is there any remedy we have against such a judge? Well, um, can we throw him out? That's we what I was going to look in. That's what I, I was. That's my next thing I'm going to look into is is, is um, personal remedies. I guess. I mean, I don't want to well, say a personal mean, vendetta, but I mean, legal remedies. right. But, but <laughs> personally, oh, this particular particular judge, um, uh, I, I, we won't go into illegal. illegal <laughs> Alabama, Perhaps I sound a little more hot than I meant. But. Uh, did Alabama do any real studies on the reasons that the schools were not progressing before they went into the court? Or did they just assume that 
Is somebody piled in a lot of money that would take care of this thing? Hey, <clears throat> the assumption is, just as you said, that money equals performance. Of course, those who receive the money don't really care. They just are getting more money. I, I mean, that's cynical, but I'm cynical. Um, what we need to look at is performance. Of course, unfortunately, this is how OB or performance-based education came about. It was a very good idea, but we, the people, very people most threatened by changes in the education establishment are the people that are put in charge mm -hmm. of writing out the changes in the establishment. So we, we ended up with the same old, same old. But I, I, I did a study that I haven't released because we're still working on some of the, the line items because the line items change all the time, so it's hard to keep up with the books across time, and that only 52% of, of educational funds actually go to the I classroom. read that court order thing completely through, mm -hmm. and uh, it seemed to me that America at one time had poverty, but they still learned. America at one time had poor nutrition, but children still learned. And... It seemed to me that a lot of the things that were in that court order, if my mother had been in that community, they wouldn't have had things like that that were not clean for their children to have an atmosphere to study in. I want to know, what are those parents doing there to uplift the communities for their own children? If they really want this, do they want to go after it themselves and make certain that their children learn the English language so they can they can communicate, not drop out in fifth grade, or do they want to say, well, we'll buy some computers, we don't have anybody to run them, they'll here, but we can say we have a computer, and it's going to take care of it. It won't. It just simply won't. You've got to get the whole community, the people, the parents, everybody involved, and say they want it. Just because a handful of them think that they can get a new school building. I mean, you're definitely correct. I mean, like we're we talked about earlier, scores have actually decreased. They've gone down in, in the wake of tremendous increases in funding. They will say that this funding is still inadequate because other states spend more. Well, you can always be relatively at the bottom. Someone's always going to be. And that is just, you know, I mean, we're still spending the same as Germany and Japan, actually a tad more. So, uh, but you have children in the classroom now that are taking... Uh, four and five years longer to finish the seventh grade than they used to. And this is caused by medical uh, problems that the public isn't even aware of. And you're spending a lot of money for that. And you're also spending a lot of money for top administrators in some of these schools. And I don't think they're checking out. I think they ought to get busy and say, what's the cause and do something about the cause and say, Instead of saying, let's get the money out there and let somebody uh, think up some fairy tale or some way that we might... There was, a, there was an article in the, uh, in the Birmingham paper on Sunday where Jimmy Rogers, uh, uh, a writer from Demopolis, Alabama, said that he had just gone back to his hometown and, and back to his old high school. And the town is the same size and the school is the same size. But when he was there uh, 30 years ago, they had... Two football coaches, or two coaches for all the sports, uh, males and females, and now the school has nine uh, coaches, and uh, and it's that I think it's that kind of thing, um, and the administration um, that if, if you want if you want went back and, and said what what are the real problems in in uh, in Alabama education, uh, that's the kind of thing. Of course, that's that's also true here at Auburn too. So I'm going to ask, how, how do you think that homeschooling and private schooling uh, in the future is going to affect education in Alabama? Well, I think it's it's definitely affected education, the fact that its growth has contributed to more better educated kids. Can you give it, some numbers on the growth of it's, numbers of kids? I, I, wish I'd, I wish I'd looked that up. It's actually hard to find. It's, mm. it's not kept track of very well, and, and that's something that I... I, I I'd be interested in looking at that education around I live in this Texas business one gets. And in Texas some of the school systems got their um, groups together and evaluated. They cut the, they had buddy system and uh, administrators and tell the top heavy with administrators they were paying huge salaries to in this country. Um, I mean I I can say that I 
feel confident saying that flat out. Um, they have changed legislation at the federal level quickly. I mean, they have stopped things cold quickly. And um, I think what that's going to do is it's going to open up the whole debate of whether education should be public, period, and whether or not it should be mandatory, period, which, you know, I would like to see. I, I went to private school and... You know, I went to public school some, I went to private school some, I've, I've been to both. And the ceiling tiles are falling down in just yeah, about yeah. all of them, too. <laughs> yeah, like to. and um, the, 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 yeah. the thing, also, when you're looking at education scores, just for, for just a second, I want everybody to realize that, that you may look and see an increase, but the ACT has been changed. It's now two separate tests, and, and what happened was the new one's two points easier than the old one. And they, they won't tell you that, but... The same cohort, the same year, scored 17.9 on one, 20.1 on the on the new. So basically, we're looking at roughly a two points difference. So the whole so-called increase, slight increase after the decrease trend, is totally attributable to a new test. When you look at it overall and adjust for the two point difference, it's, it's a couple tenths of percent point less. So the same thing the SAT, the SAT, the so-called recentering. Yeah. Right, right, the SAT. <laughs> and, but <clears throat> you say one of the great things about it is that it makes it impossible to compare t scores over time. Right. That's what the SAT itself has said. And it's the same thing as with the the uh, financial books have different categories each time. Mm. Uh, Peter's Peter's question about on homeschooling. Um, one of the reasons that it's, it's so hard to track over time that it was uh, homeschooling was illegal in the state of Alabama until about ten years ago. It was actually illegal in mm -hmm. the state to homeschool your kid. Illegal in a lot of states. In the states of Colorado, yeah. it, was, it was illegal and, there. Well, and uh, <laughs> so, I mean, that's one of the reasons that it was uh, that it's there's not a lot of information about it <laughs> is that it's uh, it was undergrounded uh, for a while and people were being put behind bars because of it. The point is, you weren't sending the children to school, right? To to the state school, right? You'd be teaching them something at home. Right. I hope that's still legal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was totally uh, illegal in the state for, yeah. for a long time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we passed by, but I want to respond to your question about the equating the amount of money with the result. Paul James in his first administration put emphasis on discipline and reimbursed the authority of the classroom teacher. He went into classrooms to do that, and for the first time in Alabama, the national uh, scores of Alabama students were above the national average. Mm -hmm. And that was against the backdrop of, of prorate. Basically, my point is that education needs to be education. Health and human services should be under health and human services. You know, so on. You have to have priorities. And when you are, have a limited budget, and the budget is just not going to grow appreciably in the future. You have to shift priorities of that budget. And I don't, but I don't think the budget needs to be shifted. I don't think anyone's saying to neglect students' needs. What I'm saying is it should not be totally shifted to those students who may have a disability because it may, it may be tough on them, but it is also difficult on the students that are in the same classroom with that child that um, you know they're all in there together and so you have to balance you have to balance I want to sound like Spock in Star Trek you have to balance the needs of the many against the needs of the one and the few and all that stuff <laughs> so that's basically what we're looking at yeah that, that's, a, that's a really interesting point if we go back to the turn of the century and we look at the origins of, of the public school the issue of educating the children is never really the major focus it was always a cultural thing. We want to Americanize the immigrants. We want to put them all into one school. We want to Protestantize the Catholics, too. And um, so, so the school system, the public school system, was never about education. And it's, it's really not supposed to be about um, taking care of children's disabilities or taking care of and curing all these social ailments. But that, that's what they're used for. Well, and if you, if you look at the, the reading... Read nowadays, it becomes quite obvious that it's not to teach children to read or to do this or that, that it is a social program. And I'm going to quote everything. Someone shoot me out if I'm done. But he, 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 said, he said that uh, at one time, he said, 
exactly, this is quite accurate, that uh, the, uh, the education of one generation will be the beliefs of, of the next. In other words, basically, you educate the kids, and you're going to have political beliefs when they're adults a certain way. And, um, and so it's, it's always been a, uh, a tool of indoctrination. Just to support Paul, uh, Horace Mann, the founder of Massachusetts, of the American public school system, specifically said, I mean, he patented it after the Prussian system, and he said it would, in Prussia, they trained good soldiers, good civil servants, good citizens to obey the state, and then that was why America needed a public school system. Well, it had nothing to do with educating anybody. Again, that, was not that was the point of, 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 of all whole, indoctrination. whole language approaches, I think, and, and some of the. Uh, Literature on subject, you can't help but get the feeling that they say, well, kids are just going to spontaneously generate or acquire language. I mean, it's, it's, it's an inborn characteristic, and you just keep them exposed to language, printed or spoken, and they'll acquire it. Therefore, we have all this time <coughs> in the meantime that we're not spending on teaching them to read. You know, we freed up a lot of time, and, and that, of course, is available for all kinds of social programs. I guess one of, one of the big questions is, does this work? Does Judge Reese, in his remedy order, ever point to any evidence or experience which uh, would suggest that his um, remedies, so-called remedies, would in fact work? I mean, uh, it's, it's one question to say whether or not we should try to help certain groups and certain problems and certain issues within the right system or the wrong system, but it's a whole different question as to whether or not it could it could possibly even work. Well, does, does, does he, there's does very few, yeah, there's very few specific quotes or, or examples in the remedy order. They're usually in the, usually in brackets, no detail, just names. Um, and Head Star is one of them, which is, is which you know I'll, I'll go on to another one, but we can go back to that one. But there's I think it's, there's some kind of reading and, and learning for life or something. He just names a couple of them that I've, I'd never heard of. Some, of, some of this stuff sounds to me like it's uh, it's related to the, the Chicago system and the Chicago mastery system. learning. Yeah, some aspects of, of the remedies <laughs> seem to be along those lines, and that's been a total failure. Yeah, the, the, the parents even sued. <laughs> <laughs> so sued I mean, to quit the program. Uh, that uh, makes it all the more unbelievable. Is it possible? Sort of a contrarian view. I mean, since all you need for a school is a teacher, a room, desks, and books, and in my view, anything beyond that starts to be a problem. Uh, is it possible that the so-called richer school districts will actually benefit from having less money, less government money spent on them? And you know, of course, the poorer districts will have more therapists and more whatever else that will destroy <laughs> them faster. Um, well, I, pred I mean, I, I would predict that they would do at least the same or better. I mean, I would predict because. Um, I mean, the way that the, the scores and everything really have nothing to do with the amount of money being spent. Right. There'd be, there'd be some uncomfortableness. Yeah, they're not be having quite, a building and, yeah. you know, and so forth, and a teacher. I mean, you also got to look. We have to also look at the whole, whole, whole nature-nurture controversy and the horrible getting thing. I mean, you're, you're talking about people that have been successful in their children. They are going to make their children successful, whether or not... You know, I mean, on average, sure, not all, but on average. And so I really think that it won't do that much. But, I, you know. You've got this problem, though. I mean, I teach the seventh graders in, in my summer school class. And I, I think so. <laughs> you want to hear this? Tale? Oh, no. <laughs> this is going to be a tale of um, it. You know, it's a, it's a sad thing. I, most of these kids, you know, they're not, they're not brilliant. And they're not stupid. Uh, but none of them have the slightest bit of respect for their education or for teachers or for their studies or anything, they just, they're not being challenged. You know, they're not in the honors classes. Uh, and they say they just learn the same thing over and over again every every year. And they can't get into the honors classes for a right. variety of reasons. So it seems to me that their minds are just being are being wasted. And they're good minds. They're not great minds, but right. they're just going to waste. I, I would, what I would like to see, and once again, it's per, this is personal, if, yeah, if I if I could play God, I would like to see a more more tracking, not in, in the in the terms of letting some kids go into technical training, some kids go into hands-on vocational training, 
and not the vocational schools we have. I'm talking about bringing, you know, being brought up more of, of, a, of a secondary elementary school type, probably secondary type training, is, and, and do what, and, and hopefully in the, we could also do away with some of the uh, vocational and two-year schools at the same time. But you know, I mean, because some kids are more hands-on, mechanically oriented. And we have an information society, but I'm afraid, too, that we're also looking at some of the infrastructure needs that will be coming ahead. And I don't mean that saying I want a couple hundred billion for the roads. I'm saying that there's buildings, there's cars, every piece of, of physical property has some upkeep to it. And um, so, you know, he does. Well, I, uh, I don't, I've got to play God myself here and bring the formals part of our uh, brown bag seminar to a close. I hope you can stay for a few minutes and, ask, and answer some more questions. Sure. We haven't gotten around to finding out how this is going to affect Auburn University yet. Uh, <laughs> I, want thank, I want to thank you for uh, enlightening us on this. I was ready for problem. that. <laughs>